Welcome to the topic 3.2 class notes, modeling a gas. You remember Avogadro's number from chemistry. We'll call it Avogadro's constant. The definition of a mole is the number of atoms found in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. This turns out to be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, a number you're familiar with. Since atoms, molecules, and subatomic particles have tiny masses, it's convenient to have a small unit of mass. One atomic mass unit, symbol mu, is exactly one-twelfth the mass of a carbon-12 atom. One atomic mass unit is about equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Here's an equation that is in your IB Physics data booklet. The number of moles of a substance is defined as the number of particles divided by Avogadro's constant. Something to keep in mind. When you see the capital N, it's referring to the number of particles of a substance. When you see the lowercase n, it's referring to the number of moles of a substance. Pressure is a measure of the force per unit area. As such, the SI unit of pressure is the newton per square meter. A newton per square meter is also called a pascal. A pascal is quite a small amount of pressure, so you'll often see pressure measured in kilopascals. Just remember that you should always convert pressure to pascals unless you know when it's okay not to do so. An ideal gas is a theoretical model of a gas. When we discuss an ideal gas, we make several assumptions. They're listed in the bullets on the slide. Molecules are treated as though they are point particles with negligible volume. They obey the laws of mechanics. In other words, they obey Newton's laws. There's no forces between the particles except when they collide. The duration of collisions is very tiny compared to the time between collisions. Collisions of molecules between each other and between the molecules and the walls of the container are elastic collisions and molecules have a range of speeds and they move randomly. Although an ideal gas is just a theoretical idea, it's useful because an ideal gas closely approximates how real gases behave under most circumstances. There are relationships between the volume, pressure, absolute temperature, and the number of moles of a gas. We call these relationships the gas laws. These relationships are expressed as the various gas laws and can be combined into the ideal gas law. You probably recall PV equals NRT from chemistry. The pressure volume law, also known as Boyle's law. The picture on the left represents a pressure volume apparatus. If we start with a low pressure as measured by the gauge, the volume of the gas bubble in the vertical column will be large. If we increase the pressure, the volume of the gas bubble in the vertical column will be reduced as the gas is compressed. If we plot the pressure versus volume, we get a graph similar to the sketch shown. The shape of this curve looks like a hyperbola, which would indicate an inverse relationship <clears throat> between pressure and volume for a gas. But there are a lot of curved functions. How can we be sure this is really an inverse relationship? One way to tell is to take the reciprocal of all of our volume readings and then plot pressure versus the reciprocal of volume. If our graph is now linear, we can be reasonably sure that there is an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. We call this relationship Boyle's Law. The apparatus to the left shows a gas bubble trapped in a glass tube. The glass tube is immersed in a water bath. As the temperature of the water bath is increased, the volume of the gas bubble increases as the gas expands. If we plot the volume of the gas bubble as a function of temperature, we get a linear graph. This tells us that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to temperature. It's important that we use an absolute temperature scale, so we must measure temperature in kelvins. We call this relationship Charles' law. Since our volume versus temperature graph has a constant slope, we can state that the volume divided by temperature is a constant. 
This allows us to set up the useful proportion shown below. This proportion is useful in predicting how the volume of a gas sample will change when the temperature is changed. The apparatus shown on the left shows a solid walled container filled with gas. A gauge is attached to measure pressure. A Bunsen burner heats the gas. Not shown in the diagram, we would need a thermometer to measure the temperature of the gas inside the container. If we make a graph of the pressure of the gas as a function of temperature, we get a linear graph. This tells us that the pressure of a gas in a fixed volume container is directly proportional to its temperature. We refer to this relationship as the Gay-Lussac law. Since our pressure versus temperature graph has a constant slope, we can state that the pressure divided by the temperature is constant. This allows us to set up the proportion shown below. This proportion is useful in predicting how the pressure of a gas in a fixed volume container will vary as the temperature is changed. We can combine the previous relationships into what is called the equation of state for an ideal gas. You probably know this as the ideal gas law or the combined gas law. Be sure to use correct units and remember that small n is the number of moles, not the number of particles. Since r is a constant, we can set up the proportion shown below. This is probably the most useful way to use the ideal gas law. It's worth noting that, since this is a proportion and units will cancel, pressure and volume can be measured in any convenient units, such as pascals, kilopascals, or atmospheres for pressure, and cubic meters, liters, or even cubic feet for volume. Temperature, however, must still be in absolute units, so be certain that you use kelvins. You already know that as the temperature of a gas increases, the speed of the molecules, and thus their kinetic energy, also increases. You have also learned in chemistry that temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. The Boltzmann equation shows us the relationship between the temperature of a gas and the average kinetic energy of the particles. This equation introduces the Boltzmann constant, which is the gas constant R divided by Avogadro's number. Note that the Boltzmann equation has nothing to do with the Stefan-Boltzmann equation from topic 8. Also, be careful not to confuse the Boltzmann constant K sub B with the Stefan-Boltzmann constant sigma. Since the total energy of the sample of gas is the sum of all the kinetic energies of the individual particles, if we multiply the previous equation by the number of particles, big N, we can calculate the internal energy, U, of a sample of gas. If we replace the Boltzmann constant, K sub B, with the gas constant, R, then we can use the number of moles of the gas rather than the number of particles. This is generally more useful. Since PV equals nRT, we can substitute PV into the previous equation and see that the internal energy of a gas sample is simply 3 halves PV. Pretty elegant, no? Well, wasn't that a gas? I hope you're not feeling too much pressure. See you next time.